Okay, great. So, so let's start. And we have Alexander Dorf from Columbia and Trinity College. And the title is on the uh, slide, Holomorphic Flare Theory and the Theater Equation, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. So everything I will talk about is um, based on joint work in progress with Simon Reschikov. And uh, this talk is motivated by the question of how to complexify um, floor theory in symplectic geometry. And there are many answers to this question. And as you will see in my slides, uh, we just try to give some answer, but there are many other people who thought about this, so I'll try to relate what we are thinking about to what other people are thinking about. So let me just uh, begin with a basic uh, review of Lagrangian floor theory. So it all starts with a finite dimensional model. Namely, if you have a function f on a compact uh, manifold with non-degenerate critical points, then you can define the Morse homology of M uh, which is the homology uh, generated by critical points of F. And the differential in this, uh, you define a chain complex and the differential which counts more, uh, which counts gradient trajectories connecting to critical points, take the homology of that and that's the Morse homology. And you can show that it's the same as the singular homology of the manifold. And now Flor applied this idea to the following infinite dimensional setup. You can take a symplectic manifold and uh, two Lagrangians in it, L0 and L1. And then you can consider this space uh, P, which is the space of uh, paths in M connecting these two Lagrangians, L0 and L1. And there is a, a infinite dimensional functional on that space of paths called the symplectic action functional. And the critical point uh, of this functional are paths which are constant, paths which lie at the intersection of L0 and L1. And Flor uh, defined an invariant associated with two Lagrangians, the Flor Lagrangian floor homology, by formally considering the Morse homology of the symplectic action function. So the generators of, so this is the homology of a chain complex whose generators are intersection points of L0 and L1, and the differential counts. Uh, the gradient trajectories of the symplectic action function, which in this case translates to pseudo holomorphic strips in M, um, which start at one intersection point and go to another intersection point. So there is a nice relation that the infinite dimension. What the P uh, in your previous slides stand for? Uh, so the P is the space of paths in M which start at L0 and end at L1. Okay, thank you. So maps from an interval. So, so Lagrangian floor homology is formally Morse homology of the symplectic action functional. So this is Morse homology of an infinite dimensional space, but there is a nice theorem of floor which shows that actually the infinite dimensional picture recovers the finite dimensional picture. So this is what I want to state now. So consider the situation when you have a Morse function on a compact manifold. Uh, so now you could look at a symplectic manifold, which is its cotangent bundle. It has a canonical symplectic form and you have a, a natural Lagrangian, the zero section, let's call it L0. And you have also give, if you have this function, you could look at the graph of its differential and that gives you another Lagrangian. And uh, for the reason that will be obvious when I say the theorem, you want to uh, shrink this uh, shrink this Lagrangian and make it close to the zero section. So you introduce this parameter epsilon. So for every real number epsilon, let L epsilon be the graph of uh, epsilon times df. So as epsilon goes to zero, this Lagrangian gets closer and closer to the zero section. And here's a theorem of floor from 1989 that uh, if epsilon is small, then there exists a almost complex structure on the cotangent bundle. So this is the kind of setup we need to talk about pseudo holomorphic strips. We need an almost complex structure such that holomorphic strips with respect to this uh, almost complex structure correspond bijectively to gradient trajectories 
in the original manifold. So uh, this implies that the Morse homology of M defined using the function F is actually isomorphic to the Lagrangian floor homology between these two Lagrangians L0 and L epsilon. So this is why I uh, put on the slide that it's the infinite dimensional version of this construction recovers the finite dimensional constructions because uh, so the left-hand side here is generated by critical points of F. The right-hand side is generated by uh, intersections of these two Lagrangians, but L0 and L epsilon, um, L0 and epsilon intersect exactly at critical points of F. And then moreover, this theorem of Flores says that there is also a correspondence at the level of differential. So it's not only the generators of this chain complex correspond to one another, but also the differential actually counts the same things because on the left-hand side, we count gradient trajectories on the right hand side we count to the homomorphic strips and the theorem of Flores is that this, these counts are the same. Are there any questions about this? Okay, so this is this is a theorem from 89 and uh, I'm interested in the complexification of this story. So uh, this is also something related to work of uh, Kapranov, Konzevi, Soibelman Konsevi Zoibelman and also Pierrick Bousseau, who uh, is writing um, an article on relation of this story to um, Donaldson Thomas theory. Um, so now instead of, have, instead of having a symplectic manifold, we want to have a complex symplectic manifold or a holomorphic symplectic manifold. So a complex manifold, M, with a complex structure I and a two zero form omega, uh, such that uh, omega is holomorphic and non-degenerate. And equivalent, equivalently by Yao's theorem, this structure is uh, the same as having a hyperkähler manifold. So, so sorry, M is compact, yeah. I'm not sure whether Yao's theorem holds for non-compact. So for here we can assume M is compact and I, there are also versions for non-compact manifolds with um, conic ends, conical so. ends, yeah. So yeah. I think it is expected that in some reasonable general generality, mm -hmm. it's if and only if. Okay. So uh, we can consider hyperkähler manifold. So that means that there is a metric, Riemannian metric with holonomy um, containing the group of quaternion isometries. Uh, and in particular, such a manifold has three complex structures, I, J, K, which satisfy the usual quaternionic relations. Then each of these has a corresponding symplectic form. And one way you can think of this holomorphic symplectic form is that if you choose a complex structure I, then omega J plus I omega K is holomorphic with respect to I. So this is just a different way of encoding this um, structure. Now, instead of having um, just Lagrangians, we could consider complex Lagrangians, so submanifolds which are complex submanifolds with respect to the complex structure I, and they are Lagrangian with respect to uh, omega J and omega K. So that's, in what I said before, I said that there is this finite dimensional model of Morse homology. Then there is an infinite dimensional model of floor homology, and then there's a relation between them, this floor theorem I stated. So um, the motivating question for this talk is, what are the analogs of these three things in this um, holomorphic symplectic, symplectic setup? And in fact, each of these three questions about the finite dimensional model, infinite dimensional model, and the relation between them turns out to be quite interesting. So let's start with the finite dimensional version. So, before I talked about Morse homology, now I want to talk about uh, what is the analog of Morse homology if you have a complex manifold and a holomorphic function, holomorphic Morse function. And in fact, you can do a little bit, uh, you can consider a little bit more general setting. So let X be a manifold, which has an almost complex structure I and a function F X to C, which is holomorphic with respect to this almost complex structure. Uh, and this function has uh, non-degenerate critical points. And we assume further that 
uh, this function is the so-called exact Lefschetz vibration, meaning that uh, M has an exact symplectic form, omega, which is the D of some one form. And also there, for some technical reasons, you have to, because these manifolds are necessarily non-compact, you have to assume that uh, you control the behavior of this function at infinity. So I don't want to state all the technical conditions, but essentially the point is that if you have a holomorphic function, your manifold must be necessarily non-compact. So you have to assume that it's uh, convex and infinity in some sense. So you can think, for example, of uh, Stein manifold. So what is the analog of Morse homology, which is associated with such a function? That's the Foucault's idle category. So this is a gadget, algebraic gadget, defining a symplectic geometry, which you associate with uh, such a pair X and F. And I will now talk about a way of constructing this category, which is not the uh, original way Zeidel constructed it in his book. But this is a construction using Morse trajectory. So this is something relating to this Morse homology story I was talking about earlier. And this is something that is, uh, as far as I know, it has not, this, const this particular construction of Bukai's Zeidel category has not been uh, rigorously defined, but it, um, there are papers of Heides, Gaeto Morwitten, and Kaplan of Kansevi Zoebelman, where they propose um, how you could construct um, the Fukai's idol category using Morse trajectories. And this is an interesting project to um, figure out the details of this construction. But I will give you just an overview of the idea. So this is going to be a, an A infinity category. So a category which is objects morphisms, and uh, also higher operations. So differential multiplication and so on and so on. So the generators are very easy to understand. These will be critical points of this Lefschetz vibration. So in particular, we need to assume that this uh, Lefschetz vibration has finitely many critical points. And that's part of these technical conditions that I mentioned earlier about behavior at infinity. We don't want any critical points to escape to infinity. So now given two uh, critical points, I want to tell you what are the home groups. Uh, so this will, be, this will be a vector space. Uh, so that defines the morphisms from X to Y where X and Y are critical points of F. And the, uh, this will be the free vector space. There will be a vector space generated by gradient trajectories of essentially the real part of this vibration. So the point is that uh, typically, if f is a holomorphic function, the real part, there will be no gradient trajectories of the real part of f that go from x to y, but they will be if I multiply them by some phase. So I have to consider a specific angle, which is the slope of the line from x to y. And for that specific angle, there will be gradient trajectories of the real part of the i theta f. Now there will be, if everything is sufficiently generic, there will be finitely many of such trajectories and I want to define a vector space which is generated by those. So this, everything that I'm saying now is in these papers by uh, Heidi Skate, Tom Oler-Widen, and the Kaplan of Konsevich, So this is the, this is the vector space, which is the home space from X to Y. So now I want to have a infinity operations and the first of those will be the differential which goes from home xy to home xy. And, and this will be a count of solutions to the floor equation. So the floor equation is a perturbation of the Cauchy-Riemann equation. And it's a PDE for maps from yeah. R2 to X. So S and T are here um, coordinates on R, R2. So uh, if I didn't have this term with a gradient, that would be just a Cauchy-Riemann equation. Uh, so this is a perturbation of the Cauchy-Riemann equation. And I want to look at uh, these planes with the asymptotic given by x, y, and two gradient trajectories. So as uh, t goes to infinity, uh, the solution should co converge to a critical point of f. Sorry, as uh, Yes, as t goes to infinity, the solution should uh, converge to a critical point of f. And as t goes to infinity, the solution should converge 
to a gradient trajectories. And given two critical points, x, y, and given two gradient trajectories, that gives me a matrix, an element, uh, sorry, an entry uh, in the matrix from home x, y to home x, y, corresponding to these two gradient trajectories. So I put all of these numbers in the matrix, and this is my differential. And then you have to show that the differential square is zero. And then also you, uh, you define higher operations, so multiplication and so on and so on, by considering uh, solutions to this the same equation, but with different asymptotic conditions. I don't want to talk about this, so let's just focus on the, on the differentials. So this is very roughly how, what you should do. Uh, and then um, Kaplanov, Konsevi, and Zoebelman argue mm -hmm. actually that that's, uh, that if your critical points are in the convex configuration, then that's something you, uh, you should be able to do to recover the Foucault's idle category. But in a more general situation, you have to uh, consider a subdivision of the set of um, critical values in such a way into subsets that form convex configurations. And then you have to package it in a more complicated algebraic category. But that's the, that's the rough idea of what kind of objects will be involved in defining this category. So I said that high operations count solutions to the same equation, but instead of having two asymptotic ends, like here I had S going to plus or minus infinity, I will have N asymptotic ends. Okay, so we want to add, so that was uh, the basic idea of the finite dimensional setup, and we want to apply it to the infinite dimensional setup. So now we have this hyperkähler manifold with three complex structures, I, J, K, and two complex Lagrangians. So submanifolds which are complex with respect to I, but Lagrangian with respect to J and K. So as in usual floor theory, we have this space of paths, so P, is the space of paths connecting L0 and L1. But now we have two symplectic action functionals because L0 and L1 are Lagrangian with respect to J and Lagrangian with respect to K. We have, uh, this, we have two symplectic action functionals, one induced by the symplectic form related to J and one induced by the symplectic form related to K. And we put all of both of those in a complex action functional. Fun, action functional. And the point is that this, uh, we have also the third complex structure, I, which makes formally the space of paths into an infinite dimensional complex manifold. So now we have a, a action functional comp uh, complex manifold, and formally this uh, functional is the holomorphic function. So this, uh, we're in the situation that I just described earlier, earlier if we think of this, if we think of this um, as an infinite dimensional complex manifold, we have this function. If everything goes well, maybe this is a left shed vibration and we could try to apply the construction of the Foucault's idle category to this infinite dimensional left shed vibration. So when you do that and you try to figure out what would be the things you need to count to define the Foucault's idle category, this is what you get. So the generators, in the Foucault's idle category, the generators are the critical points of the function. And here, the critical points of the action functional will be, as in the classical floor theory, will be the intersection points of, of these two Lagrangians. And again, this is assuming that the symplectic action functional is, at least formally, a Morse function. So in particular, these intersection points should be uh, non-degenerate, which corresponds to the two Lagrangians intersecting transversely. Now the morphisms, so given two intersection points, uh, X and Y, the morphism group HOM XY, if you remember from the construction of the Foucault's idle category, that should be something that count, should be generated by counting gradient trajectories of the, uh, say, real part of the function. So here, the real part of the holomorphic action functional is just the symplectic action functional AJ, but if you rotate it, so there, remember there was this phase theta, so if you rotate this holomorphic action functional by some phase theta, the real part of that 
will be the symplectic action functional corresponding to the complex structure j theta equals cosine theta j plus sine theta k. And the gradient trajectories for that action functional will formally correspond to holomorphic strips uh, with boundary on the Lagrangian asymptotic to two um, intersection points. So if you see in the slides, I wrote anti-holomorphic disks. Of course, you can always, by changing the coordinates, you can always make a holomorphic strip anti-holomorphic. But here I insist on having anti-holomorphic strips because that will be consistent with the with later notation. In traditional floor theory, you consider holomorphic strips, but it really doesn't matter. So given two intersection points, the home group between from X to Y counts these anti-holomorphic strips with boundary on the two Lagrangians. So that's something that is the same as in floor theory, but now the interesting part are these higher operations. So in particular, we want to say what would be the differential. So the differential will be going from home XY to home XY. And it turns out that it should be counting solutions to the Fuller equation. So this is the PDE. So now the Fuller equation is an equation for a map from 0, 1 times R2 to M. And on the interval 0, 1, I introduce coordinate tau. And on R2, I use coordinates S and T. And here is the equation. Um, I d tau u plus j d s u plus k d t u is equal to zero. So this is a nonlinear version of the Dirac equation. Oh, I forgot what is k theta. Ah, sorry, I think, let's see. So j, th j theta was. Yeah, but k. K is the, the other one. So it's going to be. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Let me get it right. K, I should have written k is minus sine j plus cosine k. Mm -hmm. The point okay. is that uh, I take the plane spun by j and k and rotate it by theta. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, just are you assuming anything about the intersection of the two Lagrangians at this point or? Yes, so this is a purely formal discussion. So it, it, for this to make sense, I will need the holomorphic action function to be a complex Morse function. So it's critical points, which are the intersection points should be non-degenerate. And that is equivalent to these two Lagrangians intersecting transversely. Okay. So for this theory to make sense, they need to intersect transversely. And it's an interesting question of what do you do when they don't intersect transversely, which is often going to happen. But I'm not going to address this question. That's a completely separate. So far, everything is formal. There is no, there is no, so to speak, precise statement yet. OK, so for this PDE, um, this is a non-compact domain with boundaries. So we need to specify uh, what are the boundary conditions for these Fuller maps. And by the way, this Fuller equation is something that was introduced um, probably 100 years ago. But then more recently, it was studied by Hochlo, Netzel, Salomon, Heides, and Wolpuski in relation to um, three-dimensional gauge theory. OK, so what are the Lagrangian boundary conditions? When tau is equal to 0, my map should uh, lie on L0. When tau is equal to 1, it should be on L1. So this is the same as for holomorphic strips. Now, when s goes to plus minus infinity, my map should converge to uh, u plus minus, uh, which are, which are anti-holomorphic strips on my given angle theta. So this is what it, it comes from the fact that, uh, if you remember, in the usual Foucault's ideal category, I was looking at strips uh, which were converging to gradient trajectories. Now gradient trajectories are anti-holomorphic strips, so I need to converge to that. And finally, when t goes to plus minus infinity, my map should converge to the intersection point. And this, in the finite dimensional case, this corresponds to the fact that uh, this holomorphic strips, the floor strips should converge to the critical point. Here, critical points are the intersection points. So you should be 
if you want to define the differential in this infinite dimensional Foucault category, uh, at least formally, what you should be doing you should be counting solutions to this equation with these boundary conditions and some finite energy uh, condition. So now you can ask a lot of interesting questions. You can ask, can I actually count solutions to this PDE? This is something that, uh, uh, as far as I know, nobody has thought about. So it, there are many interesting questions about how do you make this proposal rigorous? So this is the summary. Given an I-complex Lagrangian, L0 and L1 in a hyperkähler manifold, we would like to define an infinity category, F, S, L0, L1. Generators of this category will be the intersection points. The morphism groups are generated by J theta holomorphic strips or anti-holomorphic strips. So you have to consider all possible angles theta. And the A infinity operations will count these uh, Fuller maps. So the solutions to the 3D differential equation. So it is worth pointing out that it is not necessarily for this, uh, the way I wrote it is not necessary that M is actually hyper manifold. All these equations, everything I made, I said so far, makes sense for any triple of almost complex structures, IJK, which satisfy the quaternionic relations. You can always write down these equations. In the same way, you don't need to be in a symplectic manifold to write the J holomorphic curve equation, but on the symplectic manifold, you have energy bounds for J holomorphic strips. So the question is, what is, what, how far away can we go from a genuine hyperkähler manifold in, so that the setup still makes sense? I mean, it makes sense, but so that it's still, uh, at least it's how we can hope that we can make this proposal rigorous. Are, are there any questions so far about this, about what I said? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, uh, there is also uh, more Snovikov theory which deals with closed one forms instead mm -hmm. of functions. So have you thought about uh, infinite dimensional? Actually, it's, it's necessary for example, for applications to churn Simon, to complexify churn Simon's theory, to consider uh, the case of closed one forms. Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, uh, you justly point out that the, usually in the symplectic setting, the I mean the symplectic action function doesn't have to be an actual functional. So we actually have a multi-valued function. And yes, when we do the Lagrangian floor homology, we use, we can do like more Snovikov version of that to get Lagrangian floor homology of a Novikov ring. This is a very good question. So here you would ask, let's say I have, instead of having a left shift vibration, so a, a exact symplectic manifold with a holomorphic function, how to define the Foucault's idol category if I have just a, a one holomorphic one form? And I don't know. I don't know how to do it. And I asked people uh, in the field if no, ever anybody thought about this. And I don't think people thought about this. So if pe people uh, thought about this, actually, we was Maxim, and we already have some proposals and answers, but uh, they are rigorous in finite dimensional case, but in infinite dimensional, uh, they are rather kind of proposals and uh, theorems yeah so it's, oh this yeah. is i, I didn't know but so i would i would love to maybe after the talk if you can um, uh, may, maybe not uh, after this talk because <laughs> because i am in europe now and it's oh, okay <laughs> yeah but maybe we can exchange right. emails yeah okay yeah that, that's a great question so so yeah so even in finite dimensions this, i think this is a very interesting question Okay, so now if you actually want to, let's say we want to define this, in some cases at least, define this category as with two Lagrangians, there will be some basic questions related to studying the moduli spaces of solutions to these PDEs I wrote. And this is, what I wrote here is some sort of the standard package. Anytime you want to define such environments, you need to think about the Fredholm theory. So, um, 
uh, elliptic regularity, uh, index theory, and so on. You need to think about transversality. So you need to have a way of perturbing your equations so that the moduli spaces are of the right dimension. You, need, you have a problem of compactness for the moduli spaces. And finally, if you actually want to do something with this, rather than just defining it, you want to have some examples of computation. So there are many questions here, and I will not address all of them. But let me just very briefly talk about uh, prelim some preliminary results in compactness theory for the Fudder equation. And then uh, I will argue that um, there is at least one interesting class of examples, namely cotangent bundles, for which this uh, proposal uh, it, uh, it leads to something interesting. OK, so the basic question of compactness is if I have this Fudder equation, this 3D differential equation with prescribed asymptotic and boundary condition, is the moduli space of solutions compact? So one thing that you want to, that we want to do first, since often we will be working in a setup where the manifold is non-compact, one basic thing you want to do, you want to say, how can I guarantee that so all solutions to my Fudder equation lie in a given compact set? So I have a maximum, I should have a maximum principle that tells me that all solutions will lie in some prescribed compact set. So for example, when you talk about the usual Fukai Zeil category, you have to have some kind of convexity at infinity of your symplectic manifold so that all holomorphic strips lie in a given uh, compact set. And this is achieved by the usual convexity theory uh, for, for um, holomorphic, pseudo-holomorphic maps. So let me remind you, if I have a almost complex structure I and a smooth function on a manifold rho, then the Levy form with respect to I is given by this formula. So it's a two form given by this formula. I take the, the differential composed with, with I, and then I take the differential again. And we say that the function rho is I convex if this two form is positive on I complex planes. And if you have such a, a I convex function, then it restricts to a subharmonic function on every I holomorphic map. And it gives us um, the sort of maximum principle for I holomorphic maps I was, I was talking about. So now we want to have a hyperkähler analog of that. And this is the definition that we introduce. We say that a function rho is ijk convex. So now we have a triple of almost complex structures, ijk. We'll say that the um, triple of, sorry, that the function rho is ijk convex if the following three form is negative on every footer map. So here tau, s, and t are coordinates on R3. And Corresponding to each coordinate, I have a different complex structure. I write the Levy form, pull it back, and I, I get this three form, and I want it to be negative for every Fueder map. So by Fueder map, I mean solution to this PDE uh, I wrote earlier, this PDE here. So this seems this is an analog of the fact that a restriction of a I convex function to every pseudo-holomorphic map is subharmonic. So I wrote it in a way that you have to check it for every solution of this PDE, which of course is impossible. But actually, if you unravel the definition, it's actually a condition for the derivative of rho at every point. It's just a linear um, condition of linear algebra. So you don't actually have to check it on every solution to the PD. You just have to check it at every point. Now, if I have a non-compact hyperkähler manifold, I will say that it has a conical end. If there is a function, an exhaustion function, which outside the compact set is IJK and convex in the sense I just mentioned and has no critical points. So this, this is a hyperkähler analog of being a pseudo-convex domain. And now I will say also that an I-complex submanifold L is conical. 
if the differential of this function rho, which defines the conical end, vanishes on the tangent bundle uh, if you rotate it by j or if you rotate it by k, at least outside the compact set I required. So, so these two definitions are made in such a way that they guarantee that solutions to the Fuller equation don't escape to infinity. So this is the proposition. Consider one of these hyperkähler manifolds where m i j k, which has conical ends in the same sense that exists as function rho, which is i j k convex at infinity. And now suppose that my Lagrangians L0 and L1 are conical in the sense I just wrote. Uh, then you can show that there is a compact set, fixed compact set in N, which contains every footer map with boundary on L0 and L1 and the kind of asymptotic uh, condition at infinity that I, I described earlier. So asymptotic to two intersection points and to two anti-holomorphic strips. So this is a basic ingredient that guarantees that all that in, in our pro counting problem, at least the elements of the moduli space don't go to infinity if I have a non-compact manifold. Are there any questions about this? Okay, so, so this is something like the C0 estimate for fuller maps, but if you actually want to have compactness, we need to have also estimates on higher derivatives. Then we can prove something like Gromov compactness theorem for uh, these photo maps and maybe prove that the modular space is compact. So for that, one introduces the notion of energy. And uh, the right notion of energy here is this integral. You um, integrate over the domain, ds of u squared and dt u minus j d tau u. So remember, tau is worst coordinate on zero one, s t are coordinates on R two. So this notion of energy has the property that it's exactly zero on Fuller maps for for which the derivative, um, the s derivative is zero, and those solutions are exactly J anti-holomorphic strips. So there should be theta here, J theta not J, but. Um, Let's say we just rotated everything so that theta is zero. So this actually doesn't play a big role in this set. Okay, so now suppose that we have one of these hyperkähler manifolds and that the symplectic forms uh, corresponding to i, j, and k are exact. So they're differentials of a one form. Then we have the following. Uh, following proposition. Now we consider footer maps, which are asymptotic to two uh, anti-holomorphic strips, U plus and minus. They have boundary on the Lagrangians and they are asymptotic to intersection points. So with the same asymptotic conditions I've been talking about. Then the proposition says that the, anytime you have a map satisfying these asymptotic conditions, then it's energy is uh, a priori bounded by something that depends only on the boundary data. So this, there is some function which depends only on the anti-holomorphic strip that you had uh, at infinity. That means that if you consider the moduli space with given asymptotic data, all of elements of that moduli space have a bounded energy. So this is an uh, analogy with the fact that say when you have Count holomorphic curves in a given homology class, their area is a priori bounded. So, given a C0 bound and energy bound, as uh, we have here, there is an analog of Gromov's compactness theorem for Fuller maps. This is something that was developed by Valkuski and was inspired by. Um, earlier work of Taubes. So Gromov's compactness theorem is something that is a theorem that says if you have a sequence of um, holomorphic maps, pseudo-holomorphic maps, or more generally solutions to the floor equation, 
of bound and energy and with C0 bound, then uh, the moduli space has a reasonable compactification by adding um, maps from bubble trees or by sta adding stable maps in the sense of conservation. And there is something similar to, to, to that for these fuller maps, except it's a much more complicated uh, theorem because now we are looking at solutions for, for 3D partial differential equations. So as in Gromov's theorem, bubbling can now uh, happen. Sorry, should we get bubbling can happen along the dimension, co-dimension two subsets of the domain. So um, holomorphic curves, if you have a sequence of pseudo-holomorphic maps, it can bubble at points. So it will be isolated points when the energy gets infinitely concentrated, and then you have to rescale it, and you'll see a pseudo-holomorphic map from a sphere. So this is in co-dimension two, and the same thing happens in for these fuller maps, except now the domain that has dimension three. So what can happen is that you will that you will have this bubbling phenomenon along a not inside your three-dimensional manifold or a more complicated one-dimensional set. And this is similar to, to bubbling that happens for pseudo-holomorphic maps. But there is another interesting, uh, uh, there's another interesting phenomenon that can happen that these fuller maps can also form uh, in the limit, they can form non-removable singularities. And this is something that does not happen uh, for pseudo-holomorphic maps. And this is a completely new phenomenon that has not been understood yet. So in some cases, you can rule out these bad phenomena. So Holoch, Netzel, and Salomon show that if your hyperkeller manifold is flat, for example, is the space of quaternions or, or a torus, hyperkeller torus, then uh, these singularities don't occur and the modular space of Fuller maps is actually compact. But in general, we don't really know how to reasonably compactify the moduli space of fuller maps. So understanding singularities of fuller maps is the main challenge of this proposal. And it's understanding it truly requires new analytic ideas. And let me just mention that this um, area of research of understanding singularities of this map is also close related to recent development in gauge theory, and notably work of Taubes on uh, sequences of um, flat SL2C connections. So there's, there are many interesting developments in this area. So the summary of this discussion of compactness is that we have the basic ingredients. We have the C0 bound, we have the energy bound, and we have Valkowski's compactness theorem. But more work uh, is needed to have a reasonable compactification of the modular space that would allow us to count solutions to the Fuller equation. Are there, are there any questions about this? Okay, so this, this is what I wanted to say about the compactness problem, which I think is, is very interesting and leads to a lot of interesting problems in analysis. Uh, so let me skip that, that part. Essentially the point of this part is that, as I said earlier, we can actually relax the condition for IJK to be hyperkähler, and we can consider a weaker setup where we have a uh, uh, manifold with three almost complex structures, IJK, that satisfy a certain taming condition. And uh, we still have energy bounds. But let me skip that. So this is related to the question of transversality, because we want to use uh, perturb these IJK so that the fuller equation is uh, sufficiently generic. So at the beginning of my talk, I said, that in Lagrangian floor theory, we have this nice finite dimensional model Morse homology, the infinite di dimensional version, the Lagrangian floor homology, and Flores theorem, which says that Morse homology can be recovered from Lagrangian floor homology. So a natural question here is, is there an analog of this theorem in this hyperkähler setting? So again, consider X, which is an exact Lefschetz vibration, F from X to C, so it's a it's a non it's a i holomorphic function with respect to some 
almost complex structure I, which has a symplectic form and uh, bounded, ge uh, sorry, convex geometry at infinity. Now we can look at the uh, two Lagrangians, L0 and L epsilon inside the cotangent bundle. The first is the graph uh, of, is the zero section, and the second is the graph of epsilon times df, where f is the real part of f, of capital F. So the cotangent bundle has an almost complex structure I, which is induced from the one on X. It also has a canonical I bilinear complex two form, which uh, such that these two um, submanifolds and zero and L epsilon are I complex and Lagrangian. So the analog of uh, Flores theorem would be this conjecture that for sufficiently small epsilon, we have the, um, that the Foucault-Zeidel category of the vibration is the same as the Foucault-Zeidel category of these two Lagrangians. But of course, to make sense of this conjecture, you would have to first define the right-hand side. And I mentioned that uh, this is a non-trivial problem. But nevertheless, we can try to prove part of this, this conjecture, even though the right-hand side is actually not yet defined. Uh, so let me let me elaborate why this should be true. So this uh, the, both sides are categories, so they have objects, uh, morphisms, and operations. And uh, uh, ideally, to, to prove that these two categories are the same, we will just identify generators, we'll identify uh, morphism groups, and we'll identify um, the operations. So at the generator level, it's it's easy because critical points of F correspond to intersection points of these two Lagrangians, because the L epsilon is the graph of epsilon times the differential of F. Now for the morphism, remember, Flower proved that there is an almost complex structure J on the cotangent bundle, such that the gradient trajectories of the real part of F correspond to J anti-holomorphic strips in the cotangent bundle uh, with boundary on the Lagrangians. Sorry, th there's a typo here. This should be J anti-holomorphic strips in T star X. So this was exactly the theorem of floor I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. A, a bijection between gradient trajectories and anti-holomorphic strips. So the interesting part of this conjecture uh, is whether we also have the correspondence at the level of uh, operations, higher operations. So in, in particular for the differential. So we would want to say that the footer maps in the cotangent bundle correspond to floor planes in X. So in the Foucault's ideal category of the function, we're counting these floor planes in the conjectural construction of a category associated with Lagrangians, we're counting footer maps. And we want to know that these two counts are the same. And now this is a precise mathematical statement one can make, that these two moduli spaces are the same. So, so here is the theorem in uh, preparation with, uh, in joint work with Simon Reschikov, that for every small epsilon, there is a triple of almost complex structures, i, j, k, on the cotangent bundle, such that footer maps with boundary conditions on these two Lagrangians and the other asymptotic conditions I mentioned uh, correspond bijectively to floor planes. So the floor planes uh, that are counted in the Foucault's idle category. And of course, there is no angle theta here, uh, but you could also put angle theta here. So instead of J, you could have J theta and the same for the footer equation. So this, this theorem says that if we could define the category we want to define, then we would have this, uh, sorry, we would have this equality here. Because the, at the level of moduli space that um, the objects we're counting are the same. Are there, are there any questions about this?
Okay. Um, maybe let me not say a lot about the proof. Let me just mention the basic idea that essentially there is a construction uh, due to floor, which allows you, which given a, a map to the to X, allows you to define a map from a three-dimensional domain to the cotangent bundle. And you can show this map is uh, created in such a way that it maps floor planes to solutions to the Fuller equation. But the difficult question is the converse, whether every solution to the Fuller equation uh, comes from uh, uh, lifting this plane. And this is essentially, you can prove it using an integration of a parse argument, but this is under the assumption that, um, let me skip that. So this is uh, under, so this is the lemma. This is under the assumption that your uh, footer maps lie very close to the zero section. So you can show that if you have a map, footer map that lies very, very close to the zero section, then essentially it must be um, obtained from one of these floor planes. And then the main part of the argument is showing that actually all of these um, footer maps lie close to the zero section. And that is where we invoke the, max, uh, the maximum principle I um, discussed earlier. So you use this convexity theory, um, uh, the theory of convex hypercalar manifolds to, to, to constrain the image of your footer maps to lie very close to the zero section. And then you use this lemma and you are essentially done. So let me not say more about this. Uh, let me just mention at the end some um, open problems related to what I just said. So as I said, the main difficulty in defining this category for an arbitrary um, hypercalar manifold is the analysis of the Fuller equation, in particular, understanding what is the right notion of compactification for the moduli space of solutions to the Fuller equation. So I think this is the most interesting, the most challenging problem, and it leads to uh, many problems in analysis, uh, especially in some of these questions could be tackled using methods uh, of geometric measure theory. And uh, for example, there's a lot of work of Taubes, uh, which deals with sort of these sort of questions. And this is a question that's related to the early, uh, early question. Um, what do we do when we have non-transverse intersections? So this is already interesting for the finite dimensional model. How do we define the Foucault's idle category when I have some sort of non-Morse um, holomorphic function? And let me just mention that. So what we are, what we are proposing here to construct is that given two complex Lagrangians, there should be a category associated with these Lagrangians. So this category should be a shadow of a two category associated with the hyperkeller manifold itself. So this can be seen as the categorification of the Fukai category. And the question is, what is this, cat what is this category? And that should be related to um, the Fuller equation is an equation for maps from three dimensional manifolds. But in fact, there is a four dimensional Fuller equation for maps from four manifolds to a hyperkeller manifold. And this, uh, this category, two categories associated with the hypercalar manifold should be related to that. And since in this two category, we will have, um, we'll have operations which relate the home groups. So now the home, this is quite confusing. So in a two category, homes between two Lagrangians will be categories themselves. And there should be some operation relating to them. So now if you reduce it to the finite dimensional setup that tells us that there should be a relation between, between Foucault's idle categories on the same symplectic manifold for two different vibration structures. Then there are uh, also approaches through perverse sheaves to, um, to, to these holomorphic, uh, holomorphic functions. And it's an interesting question, how, how does that relate to um, the story I'm discussing? And there are also interesting relations to complex Chern Simons theory. So, if you have a three manifold, you could consider the complex Chern Simons functional on the space of complex connections. 
And you could also think of that as a formally an infinite dimensional uh, functional or multi-valued functional on the space of connections. And you could try to run the same, um, you could try to construct the Fukai recital category of that. And this is related to recent work of Abu Zaid and Manonescu on SL2C invariants of three manifolds. And this story should also relate to this Lagrangian intersection theory through the um, so called Atia Flor conjecture. So if you have a three manifold, which is obtained by paste uh, gluing two three manifolds along the boundary, then the uh, Invariant, Chen Simon's invariance of that manifold should be related to the, um, the floor theoretic invariance of the moduli space of connections on this, uh, on this surface in the middle. Uh, so there should be a complexified version of the Atia floor conjecture. Um, so thank you very much for attention. Let me, let me stop here and I'm happy to answer any questions if, you have, if there are any. Okay, so let me ask. Audience, are there any questions? Yeah. So when you uh, ah, okay, go ahead, Lena. Yes. Sorry. So when you mentioned this uh, category, the functoriality, is there any idea of what to do there, or is it really just completely open? Uh, you mean for this uh, focus? Yes. Yeah. Showing, by the way. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry, I lost it. Yeah. So, um, well, at the level of yeah, at the level of um, if we don't if we talk about the categories associated with Lagrangians, I think that should be related to counting solutions to the four D Fudor equation. But now you could try to look at cotangent bundle and ask how that relates to the cotangent. So it's how that relates to the classical Fukai idle category for two functions. And that I think that should be possible to figure out what these 4D further questions mean. So I'm not being precise. So our in our theorem, we show that if you take the cotangent bundles, then counting for equations correspond to counting the solution to the flow equation in the base. So now you should ask, if we have some functoriality that comes also to the 4D equation, what should that correspond in the original manifold? So I think that should be doable, but I have not thought about this. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. No more questions? So uh, I have some comments about I think last, well, uh, certainly about the last one, but it's a big story. We are, we are writing something with Maxim, but as for complex churn Simons, yeah, and maybe the non transverse thing. So mm -hmm. you see, analytically, it seems to be very difficult. Actually, uh, it will be very nice if you can uh, kind of indeed proof what you mm, what you want about the counting of the solutions of further equations even for transversal uh, intersections but algebra geometrically uh, if uh, mm, you have uh, mm, two complex Lagrangians or whatever so then you have locally defined potential uh, near the intersection, like if one is a zero section, the other was, yeah, okay. So suppose that the, the other one, which is a graph of the differential and the function is not Morse. Right. Then you take a sheaf of vanishing cycles. And this is kind of, it's one of the alternative approaches which you mentioned at the very beginning. And concerning the complex churn Simons, there is a, a kind of a non-standard. I mean, the standard approach, I think it's something which uh, was proposed by Witten. Mm -hmm. And then you count the solutions of kapustin witten equations, which are probably somehow related to count to 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 uh, this further equation in dimension four, right? 
the Pustin Victor and it's in dimension four. But there is an algebraic way to overcome the difficulty and to define the, um, uh, the partition function. For that indeed you take like, um, for example, three dimensional sphere, yeah? And the standard way like which goes back probably to IT or maybe early, take a knot inside and uh, take a tubular neighborhood and you consider complexified connections uh, you complexify the compact gauge group which means what you it's not holomorphic churn simons but complex as you say mm -hmm. and so you have indeed two holomorphic lagrangians yeah those which connections which can be extended inside and outside in this uh, two handle bodies Mm, uh, but then the question is uh, whether you really need the um, uh, Fukaya Zeidel category. Mm -hmm. So the point is that, as Atiya suggested in the compact case, you should consider a home between them and the Fukaya category itself. You do not need uh, this action functional. Mm -hmm. mm, and the thing is, that since they are holomorphic Lagrangian, you can uh, use the ideas uh, of um, the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. You can replace these holomorphic Lagrangians by kind of, let me call by D modules. Uh, right. Yeah, all right. And then it's a finite dimensional problem. You, you compute homes between something which is very much algebraic. It's like mm, getting rid of the Morse complex and dealing with differential forms. Mm -hmm. They give the same answer. And so that's very rough analogy. So I, I, I didn't read, or maybe I forgot that it's Buzaid Manolescu, but there is an alternative approach right. which allows to kind of avoid these difficult analytic estimates. I don't know. I mean, if you'll do it, it will be great. My understanding is that what that Abu Zaid and Manus could do something along these lines. So they take a three manifold, they, as you say, they present it as a Haggard split. Yeah, yeah, but it's very old story. It's a key of 80s or something. Yeah, it's standard. Right. What, so it, and then what, they look at the two Lagrangians and they take uh, 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 the, their invariance defined by, I think, Joyce and some other by taking exactly the perverse sheaf. No, 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 it's it's a very complicated. What I propose is uh, what we propose. Uh -huh. you know, it's much simpler. I see. Uh, uh, there is this deformation quantization story, which roughly says that if you have a um, complex Lagrangian, it's important that it's holomorphic setup, not real. Then uh, you can assign to it an object in the category of uh, DQ modules. Mm -hmm. In the simplest case, it's uh, D modules. It's modules over some uh, um, deformation quantization of the algebra of functions on your uh, holomorphic symplectic manifold. So locally, just modules over algebra mm -hmm. and everything like something like while algebra, very simple thing. And then uh, this uh, home between Lagrangians this complex Lagrangians in the Fukaya category, whatever it means, it's by generalized Riemann Hilbert correspondence by Maxim and myself. It should coincide with the home in, in this, in between these uh, two, uh, in fact, holonomic DQ modules. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, you can, if you'd like, you can convert it. Yeah, that's po possible sometimes to convert it into a home between perverse shifts. But in general, especially if your uh, um, uh, symplectic manifold is not non-exact, mm -hmm. there are no perverse shifts. Right. But there are DQ modules. So then, um, and, and actually we have some explicit answers for holomorphic complex chair and Simons uh, theory, some explicitly given series, which people didn't see before. 
So then, uh, again, it's alternative. So you, you, you work as a geometer, yeah, and uh, you, you solve difficult geometric problems. But if you'd like to apply it to complex Chern-Simons theory, then there are simpler ways to get the partition function. Uh, that's very interesting. I, I didn't know about this approach it's through demo. Yeah, there are some talks. I mean, I, I can uh, send you, <laughs> I don't know, links. Yeah, uh, we can discuss that. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Be great. Uh, yeah all right. Uh, more questions? Uh, so I, I think Justin has a question. Or I, I just wanted to advertise another ah, set of open problems. Talking. Yeah, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, so one set of open problems related uh, to this um, food or two category is it's the main object of study in 3D mirror symmetry. Mm -hmm. So basically like, um, so there's these 3D N equals four gauge theories and they have two different topological twists. Like one of them I'll call the 3D A model and one of them the 3D B model. Just like, you know, in 2D you have like an, an A model and a B model, right. one of which gives the Fakaya category and the other one gets coherent sheaves. And the equations for the 3DA model uh, like are these uh, Fudor equations. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, basically this two category that you, you want to build is like the, the main thing that people would want out of this uh, 3DA model. Uh, but the 3DB model is um, rosansky witten theory. Mm -hmm. And there you build a two category in exactly the same way. So you just have your two holomorphic Lagrangians, you look at the path space, you have this holomorphic function, like this com complex actional, and you just take matrix factorizations of that um, instead of Fakayacidal. And it turns out in this case, everything localizes down to like finite dimensions or like a finite dimensional model. And like you end up getting like this uh, kapustin rosansky solina category. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, but it's the case that basically just like in 2D mirror symmetry, these like hyper Kähler manifolds come in pairs. And it's like uh, expected that like the KRS category of one, like this 3DB model two category is the same thing as like this footer two category, mm -hmm. uh, like, like of the other. Um, although I, I will say that maybe the more natural one like actually has like a Fakaya Seidel uh, or like a, like a you know footer version of Fakaya Seidel category uh, uh -huh. instead of Fakaya, Fakaya category instead, but basically like there's a but anyway so you guys have built sort of like the first Hom space like it, you know like it like that you would need to start proving like these 3D mirror symmetry results. So that's the first conjecture I want to advertise, um, and like and the second one is that uh, so if you um, so just like with like the ordinary Fakaya category, uh, like when you have a non-compact manifold, there's like lots of ways you can handle it, like in terms of like wrapping and Lagrangian skeletons and whatever. Um, and if you wanted to look at like something like very simple, like T star of like a Riemann surface, mm -hmm. um, and like you could give it a Lagrangian skeleton with like uh, just being like the zero section and the union of a bunch of cotangent fibers, uh, the, like the answer you should get is like these perverse Schobers that uh, um, like basically there's a two category of perverse Schobers uh, like on the Riemann surface. Um, so with, this is the, 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 the matrix, matrix factorization side. No, no, this is your side. Uh -huh. uh, this is the footer side. So like if you looked at like a, a footer two category of like T star of like a curve with like this particular uh -huh. skeleton. So you would have to figure out what wrapping means uh -huh. like, like in this situation, which like I've, talk to uh, Reshikov about it a little bit. But like basically like you could, there is like a two category that should be the same, and which is not a mirror symmetry. It's it's more mm -hmm. like a GPS type result. Uh, like but is, is it only, it, 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 does it work only for exact symplectic manifolds? Uh, probably right now. Yeah, probably it's not right now. I mean, it's an essence of the story because if you want to have a perverse sieves, it should be perverse sieves on something. And if you have just two complex Lagrangians, which sits inside of a complex symplectic without any kind of uh, Lagrangian foliation or something like that, which replace the projection of the Lagrangian bundle to the base, it might be 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that the non-exact case, I think it's less, it's much uh, more mysterious what to do. Uh, uh, well, no, no, that's actually <laughs> what, what I said, that it's, it's kind of not, not uh, more complicated, but it uses ah. different techniques. Ah. It, it does not use mirror symmetry. You see, mirror symmetry uh, 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 relates A side and B side, like symplectic and holomorphic. And what I'm saying that because you have a, a hyperkeller manifold, uh, you can stay on the same side, and not just because of uh, hyperkeller rotation, but because these two things are related not by mirror symmetry, but by, by, by the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. And if you want to categorify, yeah, you have uh, you, uh, in some cases, like for the cotangent bundle, your um, Riemann Hilbert correspondence gives you the answer in terms of perverse shifts, and then you categorify it to perverse shoppers, probably as well as Justin suggested. Yeah, but if it's non exact, so I think that people, I mean, don't know. I mean, but the but the the intersection is minus one shifted symplectic, so it does have a perverse shift, even if the Lagrangians individually don't. Uh, yeah, and what you do, what 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 are you going to do with it? Like imagine this holomorphic Chern, uh, not holomorphic, complexified Chern Simons, which is a functional on infinite dimensional space. No, but yeah, that's so what you I would like Manuel to do. This this is use this perverse shift, right? This work. Abu Zaymanulescu is you write the intersection of these two holomorphic Lagrangians is minus one shifted. So it okay. carries and this, uh, okay. carries this uh, perverse shift, and then you take hypercohomology, and that's the invariant, I think. Okay, try, try to do this. Yeah, they did, right? I didn't. <laughs> Abu Zay didn't. No, do, 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 do they have explicit answers? I don't doubt. Because it's, it's easy to say that you take hyper. I think they have some computations. And also the case of not. I'm, I'm in the, okay, I, I cannot tell you because I, I don't remember this paper. I, I remember uh, Muhammad telling me something about it, but I forgot what. Uh, but uh, just on general ground, imagine that you have a function with quite complicated singularities. So you have a functional on, on the infinite dimensional space of complexified connections. And so you have to um, uh, derive from it some finite dimensional piece uh, and, and, and the quadratic form in the transversal direction, quadratic form and infinitely many variables and some quite complicated finite dimensional function. Actually, similar thing that Joyce tried to do for, uh, maybe even for, uh, for, for, for the Chern Simons. He tried to do it long ago, and this is how he started to, yeah. to define. Yeah. It's yeah, and it's kind of, it's a theoretical device, which is not easy uh, to, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure that everything is proven, but in practice, we tried it long ago with Maxim for cohomological whole algebras, um, and um, except of some very, very simple, like three-dimensional sphere or, or three-dimensional torus, it's very difficult to write down the answer. Because you have something infinite dimensional and you want. Yeah, I think there are some some works after that by other people that consider the case with knots. And I think they managed to compute like maybe the like not the shift, but like maybe like the Euler characteristic of the, the hypercomology. If you want to categorify, you really need you yeah, really yeah. Need, yeah. I think the main thing still missing is functoriality. Right? Like you want to that's kind of missing. And that's yeah. probably the most important thing in this cohomological algebra, algebra you're mentioning, right? Is to define the product, right? So you want to, and that's still missing. Yeah, well, it's not the only thing the, because there is this thing about this uh, um, spin structure, which you yeah, can yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so then, yeah, 
but it's sort of uh, it's it's a different technique so it's not what Alexander yeah. told us because it's I mean it's I, I I thought about this problem of course when we uh, when we are writing that paper with Misha and Maxim and I found it and I asked Solomon and I asked some people which he mentioned but at the time it looked very difficult so if you succeed it's it's a great achievement yeah well, I think we're still very far from actually saying that there is a category, but to me, maybe it all depends on what, uh, like what your goal is, is, uh, to me, it's the, it leads to interesting questions that people haven't thought about, about PDE. So that's, that's, that's already good for me. <laughs> for example, yeah, because I think that Haides, he, he did not define rigorously what he announced. Uh, uh, because I remember when we, we tried to, to, to find the reference, we found that in the crucial points, he just outlined something. And yeah, so I think even you're right, I, uh, that even in the finite dimensional setup to say, how you how do you do the Fukai Zaila category using most trajectories? I think that's already an interesting question. and. In particular, in, you guys in your paper have this nice discussion of like what to do in the non-convex setup. There should be some kind of way of repackaging that oh, data. Yeah, it's even more complicated well, because we categorified with uh, Kapranov and uh, Lev Sukhanov. We categorified that paper in terms of Schobers, blah, blah, blah. And we found some more complicated story which we <laughs> don't want to, to, to speak about. All right, so uh, uh, more questions. Okay, well, then thank you very much. Very thank you for having me. That was very really nice to visit uh, the seminar. Okay, okay. So this is it for today. Thank you. Thank you.